Hello. Today we will be talking about food bioprocess technology. But before we proceed to the first lecture of this course, I would like to have an introduction. We would like to introduce what is bioprocessing to the main audience. So basically, bioprocessing is the utilization of cells. It can be any different type of cells that I will explain later for the benefit of mankind. Now this can be in the forms of the cells itself or the cells metabolites. I will explain later what are metabolites. Now throughout the whole lecture, we will be calling all these as raw materials. Now let's look at some examples. What are the different origin of cells that we could use in bioprocessing? Now there are several different types of origins of cells that we could use. And throughout the whole lecture, I will be emphasizing on three types. The first will be microorganism cells. Secondly, plant cells. And finally, mammalian cells. Now all these different types of cells can be used as itself, as stem cells, or we could actually use their metabolites. Now so let's look at some of the examples of microorganisms. Microorganisms that I will be uh, touching on in this course will come from the form of bacteria, fungi, some yeast, and uh, some protozoa or viruses. In terms of plant, I will be touching on plant tissue cultures, and in terms of mammalian cells, we'll be looking at some different types of mammalian cell culture that we could use to produce some bioproducts. Now, if we look at a slide here, two examples of microorganisms are given. One in the form of bacteria, which is a lactobacillus acidophilus. Another is a, term, is a form of fungi, and in this case, a penicillium. Penicillium can be used to produce penicillin. And from the example of plant tissue culture here, we could see from the photo how plant tissues or plant cells are actually grown in vitro, which means in lab, to enable the production of metabolites. And in terms of mammalian cells, if we look at humans, for example, we could use skin cells. And in this example, we can have kidney cell line too. So all these different types of cells can be utilized to produce metabolites, and certain types of cells can be utilized on its own. Now let's look at some example. Two main questions in terms of microorganism cells. Can we eat bacteria? And can we eat fungus? The question to all this is actually very common. We do consume all these on a daily basis. Some of us may not be aware of it. We do consume a lot of bacteria in terms of dairy products, fermented dairy products. And in this case, I would like to give an example of Yakult. Yakult is a very popular drink, popular in Asia, popular also now in uh, Western countries. So what are we looking at? Yakult is basically milk, but fermented by a strain of bacteria. And in Yakult's example, it's Lactobacillus casei. So Yakult has been very well documented, very well presented, that it can actually enhance the health of human beings, of mankind. Upon consumption, the Yakult bacteria will actually reach our intestines. And in the lower intestines, it is very much well documented to fight ba bacteria. So the bacteria in Yakult is actually a good bacteria. So to answer the question that I've previously shown, yes, we can eat bacteria. And in this term, the bacteria actually enhances human health. Various health benefits have been associated with Yakult's bacteria. Reduction of allergy, diarrhea, lactose intolerance, antibiotic associated diarrhea, and so on. And another example from the question, can we eat fungus? Yes, we can eat fungus. One of the traditional food that is very popular in Malaysia and Indonesia is what we call tempeh. Tempeh is basically fermented soybeans. Now, if we look at a photo, it looks very different from the soybean that we know. The reason being is because soybean has been fermented or utilized by this fungus. And in this case, it's a rhizopus. So rhizopus have actually utilized soybean as its food. And in turn, rhizopus grow on the soybean. And upon growing on soybean, you can see that the structure of soybean have changed. And not just that, the taste, the aroma, and a lot of its organoleptic properties have also been changed. And this is the beauty of fermented foods. We actually like the fermented aroma, fermented flavor, or fermented organoleptic properties. And if we were to zoom in into the white cotton structure of tempeh, it is actually cells of the fungus rhizopus. And if you can see from the enlarged structure, we can see its enlarged cotton-like structure. Now, 
That was the example of us actually consuming, eating bacteria and fungus. How about we do not eat and we just want to utilize the microorganisms? And in this case, the question will be, can we utilize bacteria without eating? The answer is yes. One good example is the production of bioplastics. Now, the production of bioplastics involve a lot of uh, compounds, bi biopolymers. And uh, in terms of what are bioplastics? Bioplastics are actually biodegradable plastics that we do not have to worry about it being non-destructible. Uh, uh, it will remain as it is in landfills. It will be degraded by landfill or soil microorganism and then we don't have to worry about the problem pollution. So that's the idea of bioplastics. But what are bioplastics? Bioplastics are basically biopolymers. And one of the main compounds is PHA. There are other several main compounds. So we're just looking at this main compound of PHA. Now PHA can also be produced by bacteria. Bacteria actually produce PHA as a storage compound, an energy compound. I will show you a simple graphic, cartoon graphic of this, uh, taken courtesy of Professor Sudesh from Biology School of University of Science Malaysia. So this cartoon basically shows that the bacteria eats something and it produces PHA. And in this instance, the bacteria eats oil. It just simply likes hydrocarbons. And this oil that was being researched are actually palm-based. So these bacteria consume, or what we call, utilize the oil. And inside, it produces pHA as its energy and storage compound. Now let's look at the pHA that was produced, the bottom picture. It actually looks like a piece of thin plastic. And if we produce large amounts, we produce it in larger size, sufficient to be formed into a plastic, we can actually use it as a plastic bag. Now let's look at the example of the bacteria that was actually consuming oil. Now this is a series of photos. Throughout time, we have 12 hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours. If we look at the cells itself and look at the accumulation of pHA inside the cells, we could, say, we could actually see that the cells are growing. The pHA, or the storage compound, is also expanding, comparing between 12 hours until 48 hours. Now for 48 hours, we can see that almost 90% of the cell is all covered by pHA. So this bacteria, we can actually utilize this bacteria to produce pHA for us, and we can harvest this pHA for the utilization of bioplastics. And another example would be if we don't eat the cells, we do not utilize whatever that is inside the cells. We could also utilize whatever that the cells produce. Now what the cells produce are what we deem as metabolites. So what are metabolites? Metabolites are actually intermediates or products of metabolism. Now to put it in a very simple picture, all of us in, human, in terms of human, mankind, we have to eat something. And in this case, after we have consumed something, it would be used for growth, natural process. And uh, we would actually have to dispose of whatever food that we consume as well. Same terms in, in the forms of microorganisms. Whatever that the microorganism or cells consume, they would also have to get rid of it. But they would get rid of it via different byproducts, and we call these metabolites. If we look at this example, now there is this cell structure. The substrate, what we deem as A, will be the food for the cells. So the substrate will actually enter the cells, will be used for the cells for energy production, for maybe cell replication. But other than that, all these substrates will also have to go through the entire metabolism process. And at the end, it would be excreted out of the cells, basically disposed out of the cells in terms of metabolites. Now, there are various types of metabolites that can be used. Now, I would touch on just a few examples. As we can see from the list, the metabolites can include various types of products. It can be in the forms of amino acids or enzymes or acids or vitamins or colorings or even vaccines. Now one, for the first example, I will be talking on amino acids. Now I'm sure many of us would know Ajinomoto. Ajinomoto is actually a brand. Now it is a flavoring 
And the core compound of this flavoring is actually an amino acid glutamic acid. So uh, ajinomoto is actually acid glutamate. It's salt form. In its amino acid form, it's glutamic acid. Now, glutamic acid is actually produced by a bacteria. So for ajinomoto, to simplify the whole process, basically they would use sugar from cane. So from sugar cane, it will be processed into molasses. Now these molasses are very rich in sugars, and these sugars will act as food or substrate for the bacteria. And the bacteria will actually consume all these sugars. And upon consumption of the sugars, they would be using it for growth, they would be using it for cell replication, but they would also be producing metabolite during this whole process. And the metabolite that this bacteria produces is glutamic acid. So upon all this fermentation, the intake of substrate and the production of metabolite, glutamic acid will be accumulated. And the next stage of processing will be to harvest this glutamic acid and go through further downstream processes to convert that to glutamic acid crystals. And finally, in the glutamic acid flavoring crystals that we see inside the Ajinomoto pack. So to those of you who are not aware of this, Ajinomoto is actually a product of bioprocessing. The next example that I would like to talk about will be antibiotics. Many of us know antibiotics when we have a fever, and if it's a bacterial infection, we will be prescribed by our medical practitioner antibiotics to basically inhibit the growth of all these bad bacteria. But a word of caution, antibiotic may not be selective. It would inhibit or kill mostly all bacteria that it can come in contact with. Now, but one example that I would like to talk about is penicillin. Penicillin is a very well outdated antibiotics and if we can look at this cartoon or growth chart here we can actually see that penicillin is actually produced by a fungus named penicillium penicillium utilizes its substrate in this case lactose as you can see the growth of uh, the curve for lactose is decreasing that is because the microorganism or the cell, in this case a fungus, penicillium, is actually using lactose, therefore lactose is reducing. It is using lactose for growth, which is why you see the curve for penicillium is increasing. Now, penicillin is a secondary metabolite, which means that the meta this metabolite is produced by the cell, not during its growth stage, but once the growth has stabilized or at the end of the growth stage. So as we can see, as the growth of penicillium increases and reach a plateau, that is where it produces penicillin. And you can see that the uh, penicillin's concentration is also increasing. So for those of you who are not aware of this again, penicillin, even though an antibiotic and in many instances have been associated to medicinal uses, is actually a product of bioprocessing. The third example that I would like to touch on is enzyme. Now there has been a huge hype of enzymes. We have seen a lot of people producing enzymes from domesticated waste, from vegetables, fruit waste, and then um, they put in some sugar, go through fermentation, and a lot of enzymes are produced. And these enzymes have been used to clean, basically act as shampoo, cleaning drains, and so on. But Prior to all this, scientifically, I think there is a need for all these enzymes to be identified and characterized. So basically, what are enzymes? Enzymes are actually biocatalysts. Now, if we look at the curve that we show bottom right, if we look at the energy needed for a reaction to occur, very high energy is needed for a reaction to occur. Now, if we add enzyme or catalyst inside, we can see that the energy curve has been reduced, meaning that now we need lesser energy for the reaction to occur. So enzyme is actually a catalyst to speed up a process by reducing its energy requirement. Enzyme on its own will not be exhausted unless it is degraded. So enzyme will continue to act with a substrate and then convert that into a new product. As long as there are sufficient substrates, enzyme will continue to work. When all these substrates are exhausted, 
that enzyme will stop working. But unless the enzyme is degraded, for example, we heat it, overheated and the enzyme is denatured, therefore enzyme cannot be used or no longer be active. Other than that, enzyme will continuously be used to act with substrate and to produce new bioproducts. So that, that's the introduction of enzymes. Now let's look at some other examples of enzymes. Now we have a lot of different types of enzymes that react with different types of substrate. One good example of enzyme are the lipases. Lipases actually act with lipids to break lipids, basically fats and oils. And then we have proteases that breaks the proteins, such as the proteins in our food. We also have different types of enzymes in our stomach, such as pepsin and renin. And these are the enzymes that are used for digestion upon consumption of food. And we also have a very common enzyme, which is amylase, which is very commonly present in our mouth. Amylase breaks down amylose, a very major component of starch. Now let's look at this cartoon. Now let's look at this cartoon. What can we see from the photo? Many of us are not aware that we are in a very close relationship with bioprocessing. We use bioprocessing products on a daily basis. We use detergents to wash our laundries. We use also detergents to wash our car. We also use detergent to wash our, our plates after, after each meals. So what are actually present in all these detergents? Of course, there are permitted uh, chemicals, chemical compounds. But many of us are not aware that inside all these detergents, there are also enzymes, lipases, proteases, carbohydrates, that for example, in detergents to wash our laundry, help us break all these stubborn fat stains, oily and fat stains, help us break all these protein stains from whatever food that we are eating, and carbohydrates as well. So to those of you who are not aware of all these bioprocessing byproducts or main products. They are actually in our daily lives and in this example in a lot of detergents. So I hope I've given you an insight of what is bioprocessing all about. And in conclusion, bioprocessing is in very close relationship to our lives and basically it utilizes cells, different types of cells to produce products that could benefit us. And I've already given you the introduction. The different types of cells can come from microorganisms or fungi. And uh, in terms of all these enzymes, they can also be produced by mammalian cells or plant cells, which I will continue to talk about throughout the lecture. So thank you.